Testing. Testing. One, two, three. Yeah. Talk Darth? Oh, hey, hey, hey. Hello. Hello. Hey, this is me talking about as excitedly as I'm going to talk on average. We're going to talk about mermaids. Mermaids. Gay-ass mermaids. Gay-ass mermaids. <laughs> yes. And Which he... is funny because they don't have an ass. Yeah, yeah. That, we're going to talk about that, too. Hello, and welcome to the Least Haunted Podcast, a place where science, skepticism, humor, and anthropology meet to discuss all things spooky, haunting, supernatural, and sometimes just the plain ridiculous. I'm your host, Cody Franks, and joining me as almost always is flashing fantastically through the firmament <laughs> like... Firmament? <laughs> you threw me there already. <laughs> well, by laughing? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm your host, Cody Franks, and joining me as almost always is flashing fantastically through the firmament like a frenetically fluorescent flying fish filled with fun facts and friendly fraternity filling the fans with fancy and fundamentally fascinating folk songs. Garth. And really, I mean, this is all off the cuff. You're the one who's filling everybody with fantasy folk songs. I'm just responding. But that's so sweet of uh, you well, and whoever helped write that well, to well, say that well, about me. Well, it came from uh, I'm Ken. I'm a fluorescently flying fish. It was started by Ken on Discord and then finished by the Bi Barbarian. Good going, y'all. Uh, and well, you're the one that does the different songs for. That's true. Yeah. I got oh, I've got a banger for this guy's corner. I'm very and proud of it. It's probably in a folk tradition. I'm gonna guess it's it's a sea chanty. Oh, see, so yeah, of course, very folky. <clears throat> Uh, before we go much further, we have a Patreon, patreon.com. Oh, yeah, we're supposed to remember to say that because that can be helpful. In fact, we have, we got a new patron, uh, which this Gar's Corner will be about, so... Um... Well, the theme song, not the whole corner. No, not the whole <laughs> corner. Uh, that would be... I don't even know this person. That would be super presumptuous of me. But, <laughs> no, I mentioned him in the Gar's Corner, so, yeah, I guess it's been helping to, to mention Patreon at the beginning of a show because we got a new patron, so... Yeah. And uh, also, uh, um, the Discord. Uh, join our Discord. Yes, join our uh, Discord. We got a few new Discord people since the last episode, That's too. true, yes. So it's a growing community. The growing community of uh, the least haunted fandom. Are, do, are they haunted? Head? Do, is there a name? Have they, like, come up with a name for themselves? I don't know if they have. That's up to them to figure yeah, out Yeah, no, themselves. I can't. I can't put my finger yeah. on the scale of that. Uh, it's not I up remember to me. With my old band, the Ghost of Rights, yeah. our fans were ghosties. That's pretty good. Um, you, so you can't pick that. Yeah, you can't pick You that. can't do the ghosties. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe skept- skepties. Skepties? <laughs> skepties? That works, yeah. <laughs> All right, well. So so what's what's up? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the high C is up, guys. The high C is up. Yes. Uh, we're doing an a, a episode, an aquatic, uh, a, 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 the, you can smell the brine. If you noticed, your moniker had a, a theme. The, I, I kind of. Yeah, I kind of noticed that. The letter F, you know, a very I fishy noticed, letter. I noticed that. And uh, you were described as being like a f- fluorescent flying fish. Yes. Uh, well, today we're going to be taking to the seas to tell tale of Tish... T- it's, a, it's a fucking tongue twister. <laughs> today we'll be taking to the seas to tell tale of fish-tailed folk. Ah. We're going to talk mermaids, Garth. Mermaids, mermaids, mermaids. mermaids. Uh, yeah, well, specifically, we're gonna we're gonna start off by talking about one mermaid in particular, a very oh. famous mermaid. Oh, I think I know what this is because this is my suggestion. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and no, it's it's not uh, the Little Mermaid. Not the Little Mermaid. No. Well, this okay. is a, but it is a Little Mermaid. It's really little. It's little. Uh, this is the Fiji Mermaid. The All famous right. Fiji mermaid, uh, or at least we're going to talk about the original Fiji mermaid. Okay. Because we'll find there's been lots of Fiji mermaids. Um, I'm going to start off with a description of the, the Fiji mermaid that was supplied by a famous person. More F alliteration. Fiji mermaid. Fiji. Fiji. Fiji facts from a famous folk person it was described by a famous individual who will feature in the story later so are you gonna name them before you quote them uh well i think if i do it might kind of spoil the rest of the story can you just do orson wells then okay <clears throat> also uh given the time when this person this famous person described it uh there is something that's in here that 
could be describing the color overall of the thing, but also it could have racial undertones. Okay. And so I want to preemptively warn people that there is some uh, there is some offensive nature to this because, you know. By our modern sensibilities yeah. might. Okay. Uh, okay. So, okay. Bad copy. Or some else. All right. An <laughs> ugly, dried up, did black. You, did you say bad coffee? Bad copy. There you go. That's my in phrase. Bad copy. An ugly, dried up, black looking diminutive specimen. About three feet long, its mouth was open, its tail turned over, and its arms <laughs> thrown up, giving it the appearance of having died in great agony. Uh, so yeah, it's this tiny little uh, mermaid uh, carcass with a human-like primate-like top and a fish-like bottom. Hmm. Were there just giant stitches between the two pieces? Uh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, is there a photo of this? Um, there are sketches. Okay. This is in the 1840s, as you find Oh, out. wow. But okay. our story actually starts, with the Fiji mermaid story, starts circa the 1810s. Wow. In the eight, Sometime in the 1810s, probably between uh, 1810 and 1815, somewhere around there, Dutch merchants buy the mummified corpse of what appears to be a mermaid from Japanese sailors. Ah. Now, the Dutch at the time were the only Westerners permitted to trade with Japan prior to the American Commodore Perry forcing Japan to open to the West in 1853. Okay, but this is back when Japan was a closed off. Closed, yeah. Uh, Japan is closed off. They, they, there was no trade out with to the outside Everybody except world. for the Dutch. Except for the Dutch. Only the Dutch. Yeah. Is it, now, is this the Dust East... The Dutch East India Trading Company? No, that the okay. Dutch East Indies is the Caribbean. Oh yeah, so why I would think. they? They wouldn't be out in the Pacific, yeah. but it's just some Dutch people, some, some Dutch, Dutch people. sailors. Yeah, they get a special pass. Or maybe it is the East. Oh, I don't know. I don't want to be. See, see, guard. Sorry, I shouldn't be. A... <laughs> don't ask questions. <laughs> well, no, I want you to ask questions, but I never know when to stop my research, and that's. I don't blame done. you for not knowing. You should never feel bad about that because I'm going to throw weird questions at okay. you you never would have thought of. Anyway, the Dutch January... in Japan, yes, by a mermaid, by a mermaid from some. Japanese sailors. Okay. In January 1822, they still have this uh, this mermaid with them, and that Dutch merchant ship, it sinks somewhere near South Africa. But the crew ah. and the mermaid are rescued by an American captain. Oh. The captain's name is Samuel Baron Eades, or Eads. Hmm. I'm going to say Eads. I got to commit to a pronunciation here. So I'm going to say the captain, Samuel Baron Eads, buys the mermaid from the surviving sailors for $6,000. Six, that six thousand yeah. dollars, and to do that's and, ridiculously. And to do so, he sells his own boat so that he can afford it. So now, well, how does he get back home? <laughs> with the mermaid, of course. No, but how, he, he starts he sold his boat. <laughs> yes, but he's so he's in Cape Town, South Africa. Oh, okay. And he starts showing off the mermaid uh, to people for money so that he can afford ah, okay. travel expenses so that he can get to England because he wants to go to London and show the mermaid in London. Oh, okay. Which is kind of interesting because he's an American. But he's, his, his, his goal is not to go to America. He's like, no, I'm going to go to London. He and must show this think thing that off. there's more of an appetite for mermaids in London. Probably. Mm. By September 1822, Eads arrives in England with the mermaid because his plan worked. He got enough money to get there. And then he sets up a display in a coffee house uh, where the mermaid is kept under a glass dome. <laughs> and it was billed as, quote, the remarkable stuffed mermaid. And he charged one shilling to take a look. Word spreads, and soon he was showing it to hundreds of people a day. Wow. So he's getting hundreds a line of out the door yeah. of this coffee shop. Yeah. To and take, I, I a, assume, I hope, take a gander. I assume they got good coffee, too. Yeah, well, I mean, that must, yeah. Also, uh, this might be the first time that a mermaid is used to sell coffee. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> Comes up again later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so he shows the mermaid to a few naturalists to get their opinion of it. And he might have actually really believed it was mermaid himself. Oh, okay. We don't know. That's always the first question, right? Yeah, Yeah. does he really believe? But he gets a few naturalists to look at it, and they look at it and they're like, dude, it's a fake. (laughs) It's a fake. And uh, (laughs) it's clearly just a monkey head and torso that's attached to a fish tail, most likely a blue-faced monkey attached to a salmon. I'm I'm most curious, like... How how is it attached? Like how do you go from furry monkey body to scale body? It looks like the and monkey, make it look natural. It might have been like a shaved monkey, so it doesn't. It's not as furry. It, it, it looks like you know. Okay, so you shave the, the hair off yeah, of the monkey. Yeah, shaved monkey uh, that is somehow it's probably glued. 
as much as it is stitched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you stitches would be too obvious. Yeah. So you'd have it, it's the blending of the two parts that is the the art. Yeah, yeah, right. You got to yeah. seamlessly. It's like when CGI is put into films, it has to be done in such a way that it's not noticeable. That's right. Yes. You know, not That's so right. jarring. Otherwise, the transition is just yeah. Um, <laughs> so th- these two guys he shows it to, they're like, dude, it's fake. And he rejects their conclusion and substitutes his own reality. Oh. And he finds two other naturalists who could most likely be bought. I want a second opinion. Yeah. So he finds two other ones uh, who probably pays off who then say, oh, no, it's real. It's genuine. Nice. But then he, like, takes this audacious step where he starts advertising the mermaid by claiming that prominent, famous naturalist (laughs) Sir Edward Holm had declared it genuine. Now, this would be like somebody today saying, I have a mermaid. And guess what? Sir Richard Attenborough looked at this and said it's real. But the thing was that Sir Edward Holm never looked at the fucking mermaid. And he, once he finds out, he's pissed and vehemently denies and denounces it as being, he's like, it's fake. It's obviously a fake. This is not real. And this guy's a crook. Uh, and so he, he... Did he not expect that? I, I know, right? <laughs> Um, it's, it's, it's not a long lasting con if you say <laughs> some yeah. very famous person gives it its blessing. Okay. So Sir Edward Holmes' uh, denial then gets picked up by newspapers and they run the story of this fake mermaid and the business at the mermaid coffee house uh, slows down to such a point that they are forced to close. Like no business, the, like nobody's coming anymore. Oh, the coffee shop itself closed? Yeah. So so these poor coffee shop owners, they start out, they have a coffee shop. Yeah. It's it's going all right. Well, we could we could use a little bit more uh, patronage. Hey, there's this mermaid super popular. Yeah. And then like a month later, the mermaid's no longer popular. You know, so Maybe it really they're, was they're shit coffee. Worse the mermaid off. was the only thing going <laughs> they're, for. They're worse off than they were before and they had to close. Oh. Yeah. Although I couldn't find out, like, for all I know... Um, Eads started the coffee shop, but I couldn't find confirmation. Oh. I, I didn't know. It just said he starts showing it at a coffee shop. And I'm like, well, did, did he the, own the coffee, coffee shop, shop open at the same time right? as the mermaid? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, it would have to be called the mermaid coffee shop. Coffee shop. Yeah. yeah. Well, for the next two years, uh, he tours the mermaid around England. Uh, he takes the con on the road and hopes that nobody's heard about it. Uh, but he never has <laughs> yeah. the success he, he had before. It sounds like he's going to have to go to another country. Well, at this time, it came to light that Eads had committed a small minor crime when he acquired the mermaid. Oh. Because as it turns out, that boat he sold uh, wasn't his. He oh, was only a part shit. owner in the boat. Oh, so he no. sold, he didn't even confer with the others because he's like on the other side of the world. And he just sells this. Uh, yeah, Somebody so, else's boat. Yeah. Oh, no. He's only like a part owner in. So the, the guy that owns the rest of the boat is like, hey, I want my recompense. I want my money. Yeah. Um, and so they go to court. <laughs> and it becomes a minor media sensation uh, because the mermaid is declared a ward of the court until they can decide ownership of the mermaid. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> um, and so it becomes like there's political cartoons that appear like how stupid is it that our court <laughs> is debating this mermaid issue when really it's not the mermaid issue. It's the fact that this guy stole a boat. Yeah, right? but the that's fact the that, real... the, that the the court sees the mermaid as enough collateral or whatever yeah. of value that it's going to like be holding the mermaid hostage. Somehow, the at the end of this trial, Eves <laughs> retains ownership of the mermaid and he continues to show it off. However, he does have to pay back his debt to the co-owner of the boat, which would uh, he would spend the last 20 years of his life trying to pay it back. Because six thousand dollars. The value, the value of things is is really difficult to gauge with this story yeah. because he bought it for an, a huge amount of money, an insane amount of money, at that and it time. took him twenty years. Yeah, just to wow. Okay. Um, when he died, the mermaid was willed to his son, and it was allegedly the only inheritance that his son got oh, was God. this poor guy, gross mermaid, <laughs> this monkey carcass in a in a salmon. Uh, in 1842, Eads' son is in need of money because, again, his only inheritance was a fake mermaid. So he sells the mermaid to Moses Kimball, who runs the, a museum in Boston, the, muse- oh, okay. the Boston Museum. Uh, Kimball then takes the mermaid to New York and shows it to his friend, the source of our quote at the top of the story, oh? P.T. Barnum. Oh, Okay. Okay, and P. Got T. Barnum, it. I see why you didn't say yeah. it right away. Now, okay. P.T. Barnum had only just recently started his American Museum in New York City. Uh, see episode 11, They Might Be Hoaxes, for more on that. That's right. Uh, Kimball doesn't sell the mermaid to Barnum. Instead, they work out a lease 
uh, agreement, where Barnum oh. leases the mermaid from Kimball for $12.50 a week. That's smart on Kimball's part. You're right, yeah. Yeah, don't like, sell it outright. Here, I'll loan it yeah. to you. Uh, to create interest and buzz in the mermaid before showing it off, the two uh, crafted a cunning plan. Mm. At this time, letters start arriving at newspapers in various states in uh, the southeast and along the eastern seaboard of the United States. Okay. Like Montgomery, Alabama, and Charleston, South Carolina. Their newspapers get these letters that are telling about this amazing touring uh, exhibit. They're put on, getting the hype going. Yeah. Okay. It's a traveling exhibition of strange and exotic animals by a man named Dr. Griffin from London. He, he's English, and he's a doctor. Oh, yeah. That's credibility right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, The letters also specifically mention an amazing creature that Dr. Griffin has supposedly captured in South America. Still no Fiji in this whole thing, mind you. Yeah, because he's really a Japanese mermaid. Yeah, and then we got some Dutchmen, but nothing about Fiji. And I, try as hard as I could, could not find out why it's called the Fiji Mermaid. It's, it sounds like it's just branding. It, At some it, point, yeah, somebody it, was like, Fiji sounds exotic. Exactly. I think that's whatever. what it is. Yeah. Ultimately, it just boils down to it's an exotic location. Yeah. Because here, at this point in the story, they're saying South America, which is clearly not Fiji. Right. But here's the thing. Although there actually is a person traveling around with the mermaid and posing as Dr. Griffin, his real name is Levi Lyman, uh, oh. which... Uh, First of all, one, Griffin. Lyman. Well, well also Lyman. That's, that's an <laughs> he's example of- He's a lying of, man. <laughs> it's an example of nominative determinism. Yeah, he's a lie man. Uh, but also, he uses the fake name of Griffin. A griffin is another chimera creature that's, that's a right. combination of two yeah. things. Like a mermaid is a human and a fish. A uh, griffin is uh, a lion and all right, an eagle. I, I want to I put a little pause in and ask- what determinant nominative determinism? What is this? Nominative determinism is uh, when somebody's name ends up being oddly specific to something they do later in life. Oh god! For okay. example, no, my na- brother Gunner. His name is Gunner. Right. He's in. He's in the army. Right. In artillery as a gunner. <laughs> so d- does that? I guess that normally it works out that way. <laughs> it's just this weird thing that yeah. <laughs> sometimes people have oddly poignant names that. By, by pure coincidence, tie into something about their life. And so this idea is that did is it a coincidence or did they go down that path because their name, their nominative? Yeah, yeah. Did, do you, do you internalize that? Yes. See, I, I have a garden. Yeah. My name is Garth. Yeah. But really, Kelly takes care of the garden. Oh. I'm, I'm not that good <laughs> at it. She's much more vigilant than I am. <laughs> yeah. So the guy's name was Lyman and he's peddling a lie. Yes. And he's also an associate under the payroll of P.T. Barnum. There you go. Double. <laughs> yeah, so he's traveling around and they're they're planning these new stories like almost like ahead of his arrival. Nice. Like he's coming. He's coming. Get ready. And then, <laughs> Who is Gabo? <laughs> right. Gabo. <laughs> uh, and then he arrives in Philadelphia and still posing as Dr. Griffin, he shows the mermaid to the proprietor of a hotel he's staying at as a form of returning hospitality. He's like, "Hey, uh, okay. you had excellent service. Let me let you in on a secret." Let me show you what I got. And he shows the mermaid. <laughs> the hotelier then begs who he thinks is Dr. Griffin to show the mermaid to some of his friends. These friends just so happen to be a couple of newspaper editors. So did he know that the hotel guy was friends with newspaper I, I editors? I wouldn't be surprised. And if, he's like, look at this. That's probably why he knowing, chose the hotel. Knowing that yeah. he would then want to show it exactly. to his friends. Boy, that's some that's some smart uh, grifting. Meanwhile, P.T. Barnum, he's printed up 10,000 informative pamphlets about the mermaid, which include the description of the specimen and uh, various myths about mermaids. Basically, it's a episode. It's this episode of Least Haunted, but in pamphlet form. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Minus the truth. Um, then Barnum and Doctor Griffin, who is really Levi, Levi Lyman, right. get into a public spat through the newspapers, in which they disagree about where the mermaid should be exhibited. Oh. Barnum, of course, demands that something so amazing needs to appear at the American Museum, whereas Doctor Griffin's like, "No, I've got my own thing. I don't even know you. I'm going to show off the mermaid on my own." And Barnum says, "But I've already." I've already printed all these pamphlets. But but they're doing this publicly. They're doing it publicly. So, whereas, okay. so the public persona is, it's like rappers in a fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, right? they're, 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 they're creating a, a scandal. Yeah. Yeah. Barnum then claims, but I've already printed all these pamphlets. 
mm-hmm. to give away at my museum about the thing. I've already made the advertising. So he decides, you know what? You got to recoup your losses right? on all these pamphlets. So I'm going to release all these pamphlets to New York newspapers in the media. Uh huh. But this was, of course, after he had already in secret told each newspaper that they were going to get the pamphlet as an exclusive. Oh. So everybody thinks they have the exclusive story. And, and But they're all releasing them the same day, yes. so no one's the wiser until they all see the next day. Yeah, and so okay. but because they think they have an exclusive, this guarantees they're going to run the story about the mermaid. Oh, my gosh. And they did. All of them. at the On July 17th, 1842, all the papers have identical advertisements and images from his pamphlet this that he is produced. smart in the short term but won't all the newspapers be pissed at pt barnum for oh they lying are about yeah oh okay. yeah, they, yeah they, <laughs> but because they're pissed and they start running news articles and opinion pieces about this goddamn guy you know he he, he tricked us about this mermaid all new but, publicity but still, is good publicity yes but they don't say that it's a fake mermaid they just say oh he lied to us and said we had the exclusive so now more people hear about this mermaid he's creating a narrative where the focus is exclusivity yeah. and not even whether it's real yeah this is the <laughs> unfungible mermaid the images in the ads are taken from the pamphlet and they all showed the traditional beautiful mermaids that we've come to expect and not the monkey fish carcass hybrid gotcha. that would it, people would actually see uh dr griffin announces then that he's going to show the mermaid for one week only at the new york city concert hall <laughs> so now we've also created scarcity yeah, one week just only. a week one week only one week only be there or be Madison Square. I don't know if it was a concert hall, not yeah, Madison Square. I don't think Garden. Madison Square Garden oh, exists yet. So anyway, uh, sold out crowds come to see this mermaid and to hear fake Doctor Griffin give a fake <laughs> naturalist talk about the mermaid. Oh my gosh, I would love to hear this. He told crowds that every land animal has a corresponding creature in the sea. Examples like <laughs> seahorse, sea lions, etc. Therefore, <laughs> science, sea, sea people. <laughs> I love it. It's just like us, but instead of people being underground in the sewers, your doppelgangers are of the sea. It's great. Yes. It's great. After the week was up, he then makes public peace with Barnum and agrees to show the mermaid <laughs> at the American Museum. Ah, uh, okay. Attendance at the American Museum then triples. Now, where's the American Museum? Is it's that... in New York City. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's where the Card- uh, the Cardiff Giant was shown off. Oh, okay. Yeah. Were I mean, they contemporaries? Were they shown at the same time? When was the Cardiff Giant? So this, uh, a little bit after. So oh, this okay. is like the 1840, 1840- this is 1842. Got it. Okay. I think 1842, 1843. The Cardiff Giant is 1852, 53. Got so like it. 10 years before. Okay. That's a good context. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this whole plan, as we said, it works. But see, Barnum already had a bad reputation for fakes by this point. Oh, really? So, okay. <laughs> by allowing the mermaid to be shown somewhere else before his museum, it gives fake credibility. Oh, oh, so so because people didn't necessarily trust him, the fact that it yeah. was shown in other places. That Dr. Griffin's like, you know what? Okay. I, I'm not going to show it there. You show scams and whatever. The American Museum sucks. I'm going to do it my own way. Uh-huh. That kind of made it seem like, oh, well, but it has to be real then because yeah. Barnum couldn't even get it. And then, yeah. Wow, that is smart. Mm-hmm. After a month of showing the mermaid in the American Museum, Barnum then sends it off on a tour of the Southeast United States. Those places where there had already been those newspaper articles, like Georgia and oh, South yeah. Carolina. He's like, so yeah. So they're all primed. They're ready. Yeah. They've got it. They got the appetite. Yeah. But he doesn't take it himself. He hands it off to his uncle Taylor and gives him the task of being the mermaid's custodian. Uh, which unfortunately did not work out since Uh-oh. Taylor wasn't the same showman that Barnum was and he was ill-equipped to counter people accusing him of fraud. He here's couldn't... here's a mermaid. Yeah. That's fake. No, it's not. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, uh, you need to be a smooth talker to get away yeah. with that. In Charleston, South Carolina, Taylor and the mermaid get caught up in a controversy where two separate newspapers begin a feud publicly about the authenticity of the mermaid. Uh One side claims it's real and the other side says not only is it fake, but anybody who would believe it's real and go pay money to see it is a fucking idiot. It's a fake. Ah, okay. This also then leads to a local minister claiming that it's an abomination and he's going to destroy the mermaid. Oh shit. Now see, when Barnum leased the mermaid from Kimball, there was an agreement that uh, Barnum would ensure the safety of the mermaid and it wouldn't get destroyed. Oh, so as soon as okay. this guy's, now there's people like, no, we're going to wreck it. It's like a matter <laughs> of like religious religion now. We have to destroy this abomination, the mermaid. Wait, did the, did the minister think it was real then? 
Uh, it must have, or because like, why destroy a fake thing? Yeah, or it's an, a, a like it's idolatry. Oh, could be. You know? Oh, I hadn't like, thought of that. Yeah, it questions things. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't think he believed it was real, but he also believed it was something else. So. He saw it as 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 being bad for um, yeah uh, society. Yeah, yeah, let's let's morality police. Let's right, right, kill right. this mermaid. Um, <laughs> So because of that, uh, Barnum's like, oh, shit, cancel the tour, bring it back to New York. But that, And so he holds on to it uh, and shows it off for a while because then in 1859, he takes the mermaid, Barnum himself, takes the mermaid back to London. Oh. And successfully shows it off there. It seems that everyone kind of had everyone forgotten. Forgot. <laughs> in in the, uh, you know, the almost 30 years since it was first shown. They, they'd heard of it, but the context had kind of people lived fuzzy. shorter lives back then. So everybody died off. Who yeah, it was a whole new generation. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. This happens today. You know, the same bullshit gets every like a new sucker is born yeah. every minute. We're gonna take him for all he's worth. Thirty years later, it's all new. Eventually, the mermaid people. lease ends, and the mermaid is returned to Kimball's museum in Boston. Unfortunately, the museum burns down sometime in the early 1880s, and that's why we don't have any photos. It's presumed that it burned in the fire, although some claim that it was pulled safely from the fire because in 1897, Kimball's uh, heirs then donate a fake mermaid to Harvard's Peabody Museum. Oh. Although it's uncertain if this is, in fact, the original Fiji mermaid oh. because Kimball actually would show off several other fake mermaids in his museum. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's gets, making a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, it gets kind of confusing, which is the original. Due to the success of the original Fiji mermaid, there were mem- numbers of imitators and copies of Barnum's mermaid, or, you know, the original. It gets yeah. copied. Uh, kind of like the Carved Giant had copies of copies. Right. That right. happens here. Uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum on Coney Island claims that they have the original, but uh, this is a case of not for me. Not <laughs> believe, believe it or not. Not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And there continue to be fake mermaids that show up around the world in this same tradition. To this day, uh, you'll find them on, go go search YouTube, <laughs> Real Mermaid Carcass Found. Oh, um, okay. But as it turns out, the original Fiji mermaid was hardly original at all. And we shouldn't be calling them Fiji mermaids either. Because remember how at the beginning of the story, the mermaid was purchased from Japanese fishermen. Right. This is not by chance. Uh-oh. And I will tell you all about what I mean by that, as well as a whole lot more about mermaids in general but first, a dig, 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 dig for bones. Do you like beer? Of course you do. Do you like good food? You better believe it. Then we have the show for you. It's the Hoppy Trails podcast. I'm Nick. I'm Travis. And on each episode of Hoppy Trails, we invite you to come along on our journey to explore craft beverages and the foods that accompany them. Check out Hoppy Trails on hoppytrailspod.com or listen wherever you find your podcasts. Connect with us on Instagram at hoppytrailspod or reach out to hoppytrailspod at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Come travel the Hoppy Trails with us and remember to always say yes to the Hoppy Ending. Cheers! Did you grow up with a lack of parental supervision? Do you know all the lyrics to the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Remember Merrimick Cheese and the Fry Guys? Have an inexplicable love for the California Raisins? Can you remember Madonna's original face? Then you might be a part of the Doom Generation. Laugh until you cry with us each week as we stumble blindly through the memories of the movie and other random things that doomed us to be the salty, sarcastic, sardonic ladies you want to hang with. You know us. You love us. You can't f***ing live without us. Doom Doom Generation. Generation. Available everywhere you find podcasts. Well, wow, those sure were some. Were those? Were, oh, is that the deleted? I forgot we do deleted bones. Yeah, there's dusty deleted bones, people. If you're a patron, you're, uh, you're hearing us. Not every time, but most times when uh, Garth and I go to uh, com- dig for bones, we we talk for a bit and take a little break, you know. And uh, those that gets put on the cutting room floor. Uh, but no. Wait, can't... who are you telling now? Are you telling the normal listeners that yes. don't pay? People who don't pay. But I haven't said that we. Did, 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 those were some bones, weren't they? So we're not back yet. Oh, I thought you just did. Boy, those were some bones, weren't they? Yes. Oh, I guess I did already. You did. <laughs> oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> I was paying, all that. I was paying attention to what was going to happen and not what my mouth it was saying. Down that, anyway. that it slowed down in a way. It was probably going to get cut. Okay. It was going to get cut. So welcome back. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about mermaids now some more. Okay. Before the break, 
I told you how the fact that the original Fiji mermaid came from Japanese fishermen was not a mistake or by chance. Yes. So, uh, in Japan, there is a yokai. Uh, we've talked about yokai before. It's a class of supernatural creatures. They're oh, not, yeah. Not monsters, not demons, but they are... These are the creatures from uh, Spirited Away. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like the... Yeah, yeah. I'm, I always think of the um, the the guy the, the guy that's all that junk in the river. Although that was Miyazaki's original yokai. Well, he might he have been, made he it up been, himself. Well, he would have been a kami, which is a, oh okay. Yeah, so it, then we get into the Shinto weeds. We need some kind of grass cutter to get out of those weeds. That's a Shinto joke. I don't get it. Okay, so <laughs> okay, uh, so. so backing up yokai. Yokai. Okay. Class of. Uh, Spiritual beings in Shinto and Japanese religion. Okay. Um, there's there's a specific yokai known as ningyo, which means human fish. Ah. Now, a ningyo is not technically a mermaid in our traditional Western sense because oh, okay. it can have several different forms. Sometimes it is merely a fish with a human face. That's uh-huh. actually how it's mostly depicted. It's just a <laughs> giant, like, almost like... Those koi fish that really do have the mark. Have you seen those koi that look like they have human faces? I have, yes. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of like that. Uh-huh. Uh, so a giant fish with a, a human face. And sometimes it could be a female face or a man's face. Uh-huh. With a big uh, old bushy beard. Uh, and sometimes horns. Mm. <laughs> Other times it's... In- <laughs> sometimes it has horns, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's how you know it's a yokai. <laughs> it's not aerodynamic or what would... It, it's not wo- hydrodynamic to have they're just horns. Little, they're just little spiky horns. Anyway. Oh, okay. Uh, sometimes it is indeed the top half of a human and the bottom half of a fish. Okay. Uh, other times it can be depicted as having a regular human body, but it's just covered in scales. It's a fishy ah, dude, fishy person. The swamp thing. Yeah. <laughs> Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. The earliest written account comes from the 7th century AD and is from the second oldest book of classical Japanese history, the Nihon Shoki. Ah. Uh, in that appearance, they are specifically referenced as freshwater beans. Oh, okay. They later then make the... Uh, the, the leap? The leap, yeah, to salt water. <laughs> the free uh, willy? <laughs> yeah, they, they, <laughs> you know, they, they develop the ability to... They, they first, I think there's probably the intermediary tidal zone, some brackish water involved. And yeah, then they head yeah, out yeah. To sea. They're slowly getting used to salt. Yeah. Uh, the Ningyo was thought to be a harbinger of calamity oh. uh, sometimes, uh, as well as be having several other magical qualities. So sometimes it's like you see one, that means something bad is going to happen. But mm. other times they can be prophets and tell you your fortune. Oh, okay. Uh, as I was reading about this, a bunch of stuff in like video games and anime and stuff from Japan suddenly clicked into place. Like, oh, because uh, in the Legend of Zelda game, The Wind Waker, uh-huh. as you explore your map, you find a fish that it has an um, old man's face and it talks ah. to you and it then tells you like it, it fills in your map and tells you like where you can go and gives you direction. Oh, like, okay. oh, that's totally a Nino. I didn't oh, even realize that. There's also uh, a myth about if somebody consumes its flesh, they are granted either long life or, or immortality. Wow. Yeah. During the Edo period, which is from 1603 to 1868 AD, there was a tradition of crafting fake ningyo mummies by sewing together the carcass of a monkey with that of a fish. No kidding. (laughs) Now, the Edo period lasted until 1868. Ah. The original Fiji mermaid, 1810s, 1810s. is when it showed up. Ooh, that sounds case closed, Dr. Watson. Now, why were they making these... these (laughs) Uh, Nino mummies, and it was because they would then uh, sell them to shrines that show them off as religious icons or sacred artifacts. What was it understood that they were depicting Nino, or did, yeah. did the people think that these were real mummies of it actual? Could be. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Interesting. Um, so there was a whole industry though of making them because it was like they probably like if you were in a city, a, a, a fishing village, yeah. or you know, seaside town where these were made. Yeah. You probably knew, like, okay. But this, is, this, this is symbolic of the real guys yeah, yeah. that are out there. We made this. But by the time this this uh, this taxidermy Nino makes its way to rural settings and rural shrines, they might they might they don't believe yeah, it. Exactly. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, there's actually a whole sto- uh, myth of a priestess who she was a princess who accidentally ate the flesh and becomes immortal. Oh, I think her name translates to like the 800 year monk 
but it's accidental. So she really she, she's the eight hundred year priestess. She didn't want to yeah. be. Uh, and then eventually she uh, decides that she's grown tired and wishes to die, and so she seals herself inside of a mountain. Oh. And then they plant a. I forget what kind of tree it is. They plant outside. And as long as that tree's alive, it also indicates that she's alive inside the mountain. And this is a very long lived huh. tree. And so it's part of the shrine's whole mythology. Oh, is I see. Like, this is where the 800 year princess, uh, priestess is in the mountain. And that would be a shrine that probably would have an Ingyo mummy because it's like, hey, this is part oh, of the story. Oh, I see. Her, I see. Yeah, her origin That's a story. pretty good run. I think after 800 years, I'd be about done. Yeah. There's also a tradition of these things called uh, Jenny Hanover's. Jenny Hanover's. A Jenny Hanover is a uh, dried out ray or a, sometimes called skates. You know, they're like, uh, they're in the shark family. They're fish that have cartilaginous skeletons. They don't have bones. They have, they're all cartilage. Oh, okay. So they take like a, a, a small like bat ray or manta ray or sting ray. Oh, okay. And while it's still wet, they can like cut it in a certain way so that when it desiccates and dries, it now looks like a little person. Oh, interesting. Because the underside where its mouth, it has its mouth in two holes that aren't its eyes. Its eyes are on its top half, but they are like nostrils. It looks like a face. Oh, so with with just a little bit of uh, changing and cutting, you can let it dry out to look even more like a person. Yeah, and and, and they can be made to look anything from like little mermaids to uh, dragons. Uh, And it probably comes from a French phrase, which was Jean d'Anver which means the youth of Antwerp. I don't know why they would use that as a thing, but then British sailors heard the name uh, and they pronounced it as Jenny Hanover. And so that's now the term that's uh. used for any one of these things. And uh, yeah, look them up. They're pretty whimsical and interesting looking. I'm going to look them up right yeah, now. Yeah, Jenny Je- Hanover. Jenny Hanover. Yeah. Jenny for all Hanover. you people listening to the podcast while driving, I will describe it to you using uh, such descriptive language you won't even need to see this. Jenny Hanover. Yeah, and it's just to illustrate that, like, you know, you have people in Japan who are making these. <laughs> the, oh, yeah, it, lo- it is a stingray, but yeah, no, it's it's basically looks like a shriveled up uh, orange skin or something. But yeah, you can tell it's a stingray, but yeah, it's just sort of looks like a person with a, a little hat. They're pretty cute. Yeah, that's a Jenny Hanover. And so that's I guess that's another, not a great description, but um, yeah. Another tradition of making these fake sea creatures uh, that appear to be like mermaids, which brings us to the general topic. Like, what about mermaids in general? What's with the mermaids? What's the deal with mermaids? What's the deal? So the idea of a human-fish hybrid creature is incredibly old. Oh, yeah. And also incredibly widespread. Just about every culture has a story or a myth about some kind of aquatic human equivalent or spirit. Isn't that fascinating? We've run into this before, yeah. but when you have these universally, like th- things that seem to, it's not like the tradition started somewhere and spread all over yeah. the world. It most likely these archetypes. all independently yeah. evolved just because it sounds about right. And, and, and there's people who even to this day believe that mermaids are real. Sure. And uh, they would point to something like that is evidence that they have to be real. Otherwise, why would everybody have a story about it? Well, the answer to that is that the brain is a piece of hardware. And oh. all I mean. <laughs> it is running software. And if yeah. everybody, every human has the same hardware running the same software, it's going to create similar things. Yeah, and so yeah, that, the, um, the abstract things behind mermaids that we're going to discuss uh, in a little bit here help explain like yeah it's it's an archetype for a reason it, it, it stands say, for certain you're things. Sa- saying it's something that would naturally develop yes uh you, you could you could take some humans and stick them on a new planet and give them a few thousand years and they'd make up their own mermaid thing as long as there's oceans there maybe on the planet yeah and fish or yeah like that. but yeah okay okay uh one of the earliest representations uh we have of what could be called a mermaid like an actual physical item or image comes from 3000 BCE, or wow. 5,000 years ago. Wow. It comes yeah. from Luristan, which is a mountainous region in western Iran. Uh, it's a small bronze that depicts a female figure with two spread fish tails instead of legs. Ah. And then she is holding a tail in each of her hands. This is the Starbucks? Sound familiar? <laughs> this is the Starbucks logo. <laughs> Very old. Uh, now, that's not a place that's all that close. Is it, was it near the ocean? 
uh, it's Iran. I it's think Western it's Iran. Yeah, it's desert. It's and also it's up in the mountains. But and the but people, five thousand years ago, the vegetation was probably well. Different. The people who uh, had this item, uh, and it, actually, there's it's not just one of these that is found. It it seems that these might have been mass produced, ah. and possibly either by the same person or family, or at least from the same mold because they're identical. Mm-hmm. The people who had them, though, they were. Um, they were like shepherds. These are people oh, up in the high mountains yeah, you know, who are with, grazing things up in mountain meadows. With fish totems. With fish totems. Well, we can only assume that this might be a fertility goddess, which I know sounds like, okay, that's what they always say. Yeah, I was about to say, is, is every case, sculpture of a lady from a long time ago well, a fertility goddess? Well, if she's spreading her legs and has an open vulva. Oh, oh, so you see everything. It's yes. not the Starbucks where they cut where they yeah, cut that exactly. part out. Yeah, no. you, you, the yeah. whole thing. Yeah, is right this there. is this is like the type of mermaid that's the fish part on the bottom, but also still has a vagina. Right, right. Fry well, would be delighted. Well, this is. <laughs> Why couldn't she be the other kind of mermaid with the fish part on top and the lady part on the bottom? <laughs> this is something I wanted to bring up just in general. When you imagine a mermaid, it just makes a lot more sense that they'd have individual legs that then turn into yeah. I mean, yeah. Anyway. Um, so the idea is that it could be a fertility goddess or totem that represents the fertile aspects of both life from the sea oh, and yeah. life on land. Because both are full of life and, and are, a lot of places are reliant on them for life. Hmm. Um, so it's like a transitional thing between the sea and the land. Uh, is, is it because the sea is represented in the fishy parts yeah. and the land is represented in the human just parts? Just water in general. You know, uh, okay. we, don't, we assume that it's the sea. But yeah, this actually, just this could be a be, freshwater mermaid. Yeah, it could just as easily represent something that's in a lake. I hadn't thought of that. But yeah, so even if it is in some yeah. landlocked area, that could still and, make sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is close to Mesopotamia. Right. And human fish hybrids feature frequently in Mesopotamian artwork. Although this one bronze is like the earliest thing, but we do know later in Mesopotamia you find uh, a lot of artwork showing fish-human hybrids on cylinder seals. They're the cylindrical clay seals that you would roll on a piece of clay to stamp oh, or emboss. I made one of those yeah. in middle school. Yeah. And so you see these uh, fish hybrids. Uh, the earliest written record of a mermaid-like creature are descriptions of a Targatis. A Targatis? A Targatis. Uh, who was the chief goddess of ancient Syria in Canaan. Oh, okay. Or Canaan. Uh, she was a goddess of fertility and the sea, and her symbols were uh, fish and doves. Oh, okay. So that's one reason why we could also say maybe these people up in uh, with that bronze, they were probably trading with the same people who were practicing this religion that is the Syrian, ancient Syrian oh, religion. Oh, yeah. So it might have and been so traded and, yeah. and made somewhere else yeah. that just happened to end up yeah. up in the mountains. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so Adargat, God, why is it so hard to say Adargatis? Uh, Adargatis. <laughs> according to one myth, she dove into a lake to take the form of a fish, but the other gods, not wanting her beauty to vanish, decreed that only her bottom half could become a fish and she would remain a woman, a sexy, sexy woman on the top. In the first century <laughs> BCE, Greek historian Diodorus Siculus described her as having the face of a woman, but on the body of a fish, kind of like the Nino. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he describes a specific temple where she is worshipped in this aspect. Um, her worship actually spreads throughout the entire ancient world, uh, and she took on many different names depending on where she was being worshipped. And she be represented by varying combinations of fish and woman. And this happened mainly because Alexander the Great conquers Syria. Oh. And then she gets folded into the Hellenistic religion of like ancient Greece. And she's given like a Greek name. And Right. Um, as so often happened, the conquered people's gods yeah. kind of took a ride on with them and then yeah. became part of the pantheon of the, the conquerors. Yes. And then this leads to like where we most people, when you think mermaid, a lot of people start with ancient Greece. That's kind of where people start thinking about mermaids. Well, I think of, uh, I, I always confuse them with sirens. Yes. Because of a, a, the Odyssey and Homer and all of that. But yeah. But I guess they are different. Yeah. And I will bring that you up. You will bring that up. Yes. Okay. I will not bring that up now. Then. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, I just have to, we have to get there first. Okay. Yeah. We're on our way We're on to our the way sirens. There. Yeah. Got That's it. further, that's a... Uh, a few coastlines. A ahead. few more knots <laughs> yeah. away. No, the knots are of uh, speed. Leagues. We're leagues. leagues. It's a word that it's not twenty thousand leagues, but it's a it's a few hundred. A few leagues away. Okay. So uh, mermaid imagery gets a boost in the myth of the birth of Aphrodite. Oh. From the, uh, arising from the sea. Venus it, on the half shell. Right? Yeah. 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 In the myth. Uh, Uranus has his dick cut off and thrown into the sea, where it then ejaculates and impregnates the ocean. 
What? Wait, so did his balls go with it? I guess he had everything. Oh, uh, okay. He's castrated. It would have to, because, yeah. okay. Yeah. He's dick and balls. Uh, wow. And then that impregnates the ocean, and then Aphrodite <laughs> the entire emerges. ocean. <laughs> yeah. In, in depictions, though, as she's being lifted out of the water on the giant shell, yeah. the shell itself is being held aloft by two male figures, which are men on the top, but fish on the bottom. I don't remember seeing that in Michelangelo's... These are ancient. Uh, these are the old ancient depictions. Oh, interesting. He's copying older things. Got it. Got it. Got and it. His, I think, what there's the little like, there's some people on holding, either yeah, side holding yeah. little blankets yeah. and stuff. But no, I don't but remember there being uh, fishmen on the bottom. No, there is a uh, a notable um, mosaic, floor mosaic in uh, an ancient Greek ruin that depicts oh. this scene. And oh, okay. you have these with these the mermen, mermen, the burly... and these mermen have names. They are Bythos and Aphros. Uh, which are the personifications of the deep, bathos, think bathosphere. You know, like an old school diving bell was called a bathosphere. Was it? Yeah, it's bathos for the deep. I'm going to take a bath. We talked about, I think, the bathosphere in Tano. Well, I, I remember people would submerge themselves in giant spheres. Yeah, that's a bathosphere. The most terrifying And it thing gets I its name imagine. from bathos, meaning de- deep, the depths, uh-huh. and sphere, because it's a sphere. sphere that yeah. comes from this merman. Bythos oh, okay. And his uh, brother Aphros, who is the uh, rep- personification of sea foam. Oh, okay. Got sea it, foam, got not it. just fish cum. It's also Af- uh... Aphros. <laughs> Aphros, spell A P H R O S. Oh, okay. Not like an Afro. No. Okay. Different. Different. False Animology. cognate. Yeah. Uh, and indeed, from this point on, it would be best to refer to them as mer people. Because in yeah. the classical world, you were just as likely to see a merman as you were to see a mermaid. Interesting. Okay. You got like Tritons. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Neptune's depict- kingdom, all yeah, that yeah. stuff. They all had fish fish. And legs. so then that brings us to, speaking of the classical world, how can we not bring up sirens? Right. Well, because sirens are not mermaids, as you hinted at before. Yeah. Well, so now, I, when, when, when we were talking about doing this episode, I, I was like, oh, I want to do a Garth's Corner on sirens. And Cody's like, sirens aren't mermaids. Yeah. You didn't say it like that, but, but I, that was news to me. So. Well, it's like, don't believe me? Go read the Odyssey. Okay. Homer makes no mention of what sirens look like. Remember, you it's can all only about, hear them. It's about yeah, yeah. hearing the right, siren. Right, right. And the earliest artistic representations of the scene of the siren, part of the Odyssey, which we see on painted on pots and in mosaics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we know it's that scene because there's a dude tied to a mast while a bunch of people are rowing. Most and likely the Odyssey, yeah. The Odyssey. <laughs> but in these, he is the sirens are depicted as women on top. But birds on the bottom. Now that's interesting. They but are they, birds. They, but they are like hanging but, out by the water. So they're like seagulls. Yeah, but they're not harpies. They're not. Oh, okay. Which is another thing that is a, a woman combination. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, but these are. Sirens. Sirens. These are the sirens. Uh, and it makes sense since sirens, you know, sing and fish don't sing. But that's birds do. A good point. I had not thought about that. But yeah, birds are known for their singing. Yeah, and they also could be seabirds. Um, the only <laughs> now I'm imagining the sirens are like tweeting seductively and yeah, beautifully. I think they don't describe the um, they don't describe the sirens themselves. But I think there's a description of the island they're on has a bunch of bones around it. Ah, so that that's be, never a good. But sign. that could also be like yeah. a seabird's nest with bird. Oh, that's the, true. You know, yeah, the yeah, bones yeah. of fish and stuff that they bring up to eat. Um, it's also possible that these bird-like sirens are influenced by the Ba of Egyptian mythology. Um, in Egyptian mythology, when you die, you have like two parts of your soul. There's the Ka and the Ba. Which one do you weigh? Oh, it's the heart that gets yeah. weighed. But the Ka and the Ba. And okay. the Ka, I think, is the one that then actually does move on to the afterlife completely. But the Ba is depicted as a little bird with a human head. And sometimes it has human arms, but also has the wings. Uh, so it's like a, a weird half angel. And it, um, it flies between the mummified corpse to the land of the dead at night, but must return to the body by day. It does this every day forever? Yeah. That's oh, why uh, the tombs have to have like food and representation of things, because the, the Ba, when it's there, it needs to eat. It's fascinating that... They divided the concept of the soul up into two. Yeah. Because I think pe- when with the afterlife, you always imagine, well, what happens to you after you die? Well, you go here or here. But in this case, it'd be like, well, you Party. become two. Yeah. <laughs> and one half of you goes somewhere. That's so fascinating. Yeah. That's like very different. That's a way, very different way of thinking about oneself uh, than yeah. other religions. And, and the ancient Greeks were trading with Egypt. So Early they, on, so, so they this, knew this. This would have yeah, right. spilled over mm-hmm. into their mythos. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, either way, sirens, not mermaids. Got it. If anything, they're chicken ladies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but later they became depicted as mermaids. And this happens gradually at first, but ah. then it really picks up speed after the advent of Christianity. I wonder why that is. That's interesting. Uh, it, it's because um, mermaids can then be combined with sirens for morality purposes and be used to illustrate certain things in a Christian worldview. Is, is, is it something about like avoiding temptation? Yeah. That sort of whole thing. The idea of the, uh, the voyage. Because chicken women aren't sexy yeah. like mermaids are sexy. Right. That's probably why. So uh, what do you look like? Well, I'm six feet tall yeah. with, lo- with lots of charm and, and a charm bracelet <laughs> and a beak <laughs> and, and chicken's feet and big brown eyes. And I'm wearing a house dress with nothing on underneath because I'm hot, hot for you. Okay. There actually is a transitional myth that uh, I'm not sure who it's ascribed to, but there's a transitional myth in Greek or in in ancient Greece that is about how they transitioned from birds to mermaids. And the story is... (laughs) I love, I would love to hear this story. The story is that the sirens challenge the muses to a singing contest. Oh, nice. And the sirens lose. And so because they lose, they are stripped of their bur- their wings. Oh, they get demoted. And they the then have to go into the sea and then they become like fish people. And there actually are two small islands off the coast of Crete. And uh, they say, it, in the story, it describes that when they lose their feathers, they are white skinned underneath and very b- white colored. Uh-huh. And one of those little islands is called the White Island. Ah. And the other island that's right next to it translates to without feathers. <laughs> so, so that's is, where it happened. This is where it happened. That was where yeah. the, 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 the singing competition happened, clearly. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, that's good. Which is pretty interesting. So they like, yeah. so as their like iconography started to change, they're like, you know, we better make up a story that kind of like retcons and explains this. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah because that go. is that is kind of a jump. It's like, well, are they fish people or are yeah. they bird people? So Here's I guess when story. I say that mermaids are not sirens, or sirens aren't mermaids, I should say they, they weren't mermaids. Not at the time of Ulysses. Yeah. They were still bird people. Yeah. Okay. And now they've become mermaids. Got it. So yeah, by the medieval period, sirens were exclusively depicted as mermaids. The Starbucks siren, not a siren, but a mermaid. She has a crown too. Specifically, she's probably one of the oldest mermaids in human history. Wow. Uh, And she might actually be Arda goddess. She might be that goddess. The image of the the Starbucks. I've seen the original Starbucks. Yes. Because, like, the Starbucks logo is sort of a simplified vector art type of a thing of a lady with the crown. She's smiling. Yeah. But it's based on an old line because, drawing thing. Yeah, well, because you have this, even though there's this ancient bronze that's 5,000 years old. Yeah. That image of the two-tailed mermaid holding her own tails yeah. gets repeated over and over again, all the way into like heraldry in the medieval period. That's, isn't that interesting? When when a it's single a meme. Image, it's a meme. It's just, a meme. Yeah. yeah, it just kept going, and then eventually ends up on coffee cups. Wow. And like we said before, not the first time that a mermaid was used to sell coffee. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, now, there's of course lots of other cultures that have versions of mermaids. Mm-hmm. Like we said, you know, go anywhere you can find them. Depending on where you go, it's like, okay, so do we define the mermaid as the fish and human combination, or is it any human that lives underwater? Well, that's actually a really good point, because if these all these different traditions uh, arose independently, we're just calling them mermaids because they remind us yeah, exactly. of mermaids. Yes. So, yeah, how do you define a mermaid yeah. then? <clears throat> e- either way, you're just naming it what we think of, but really they have their own. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and some, like, yeah. So I, I would define it as a fish. A, a, a Anything that's a fi- half fish, half human, more or less, sixty forty probably yeah. works still. Because there's that, that's close enough. There's some that like um, you know, like the naiads are water nymphs, right? You know, and they're more wim- they're, ladies, they're more the, ladies. Yeah, but from then t- head yeah. to toe, yeah. So yeah, are they mermaids? Well, and also then if you ask say mermaid, does that mean based off the name? As I'm gonna get into here, uh, the name comes from uh, Middle English. Actually, specifically from Chaucer in the Canterbury Tales. Oh, no kidding. And it's a compound word of mare is sea and maid or a young girl. Right. So based on that, is it a mermaid if it doesn't live in the sea? Or if it gets older, does it become a mermaiden? Chaucer using that, he's actually borrowing from older, uh, old English and old Norse. Because in old, in old Scandinavian folklore, uh, in Norse mythology, you have the half uh, the half fru is literally means sea woman. Oh, okay. 
somehow the old Norse word half meaning ocean or the sea was replaced. And, and becomes, Frau is woman. Yeah. Frau. Like German. Yep. Like Frau. Um, and so he's like, uses a cognate. Well, what's like a woman? Well, maid. And yeah. So that's where that comes from. Interesting. And so, yeah. And the, the uh, half Frau is a creature uh, with the torso and head of a beautiful woman and the lower body of a fish. Similar to other depictions we've seen of mermaids, their roles can be varied. It can be an ill omen or it can be... Something like, wow, that's cool. I saw that. That must mean something. Mm. Um, and they can act like a siren and entice men. Um, and there is a function to this mermaid myth. But that don't comes. don't jump overboard. I mentioned how in the medieval period and after Christianity, they really started to conflate the siren and the mermaid together. Right. And it was about morality because you could interpret the story of the sirens in the Odyssey as a warning about... Uh, if you n- don't pay attention, that calamity could happen. If you get distracted by these. Right. right. And that's when we get the idea like, oh, she's a temptress. A siren is a temptress. It right. tempts you away from God's path. Yes. Right. Yes. And so the mermaids. Those harlots are, of the sea. Yeah. So the mermaids are uh, now supposed to stand in for like sexual desire and mm-hmm. temptation. Uh, they're often depicted with a mirror and a comb. And they said, oh, that's because they're vain. Uh, oh, okay. Really, the idea of a mermaid with a mirror is a lot older than that and has been depicted oh. earlier than that. And it was um, that the mirror could be a stand-in for um, the transitional nature of the sea. It's like a metaphor. It's that the oh. sea is a liminal space. I'll get into that later. Whoa. Yeah. That's um, pretty far out philosophically. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But yeah, so Scandinavia, they got the, the half free, uh, which brings us to... Den Lille Hafru. Den the, Lille Hafru. The Little Mermaid, 1847. Oh, I was wondering Christian if we Anderson. were going to actually do this. Okay, yeah. so I don't really know the story. I've heard it's more tragical. Oh, yes. But I never read the original book. I did see The Little Mermaid like once. Okay, um, so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Cody crack, as Cody cracks his knuckles. Is it actually a story time now? Not really. I'm oh, just okay. going to go through the okay. basics of it. Uh, so. It's a, basically it's a story about a mermaid who wishes to walk on land in order to be with a prince who she has fallen in love with and uh, to gain a soul. Because, oh, uh, mermaids don't have souls. Mermaids don't have souls. And mermaids the, don't go, not all mermaids go to heaven. <laughs> and the original story is vastly different from the Disney version. Like, really different. Uh, in the Disney version, she uh, sells her voice, which is kind, right. of, kind of true. Uh, in the original, she has to rip out her own tongue. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> and then gives her ripped out tongue to the sea witch for a potion that will transform her and give her legs. But when this happens, she's told that the process is going to feel like she's being run through by swords. The process of getting legs? Yes. And losing her tail. Oh, probably because the tail's getting cleft in twain. Yeah. So it's going to feel like she's being stabbed with swords. She's like, why couldn't I have been one of those mermaids with two tails already? <laughs> then... Uh, to Actually, walk. she couldn't say that. She had no tongue. Yeah, right? She. <laughs> um, but then to walk will cause her extreme pain. She'll be in constant pain when she walks. It'll oh, feel geez. like daggers stabbing her legs, and her oh. feet will bleed constantly. This is not a good deal. Uh, also, if the prince fails to fall in love with her and instead falls in love with someone else and marries them, on the morning after his wedding night, she uh, will die. But if she does get him to fall in love with her and marry her, she gains part of his soul. And so then she will oh, have Oh, that's how soul. she gets the soul. Yeah. Now, she, who, who, what, who does she make the deal with, this terrible deal? I guess it's the sea witch's the deal. The sea witch, okay. If she fails and she dies, she will then turn into sea foam, which is what happens to all mermaids when they die. Ah. Apparently that's what sea foam. Sea foam is mermaid. Uh, dead mermaid. D- dead mermaid. Not just fish cum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Por que no los dos? Yeah, okay. However, in the story, uh, the prince does not fall in love with her and instead oh. falls in love with another princi- princess. Now, this has been a tragic irony. So what happens is before the reason she wants to she sees the prince before she gets legs and falls in love with him. And that's why she makes the deal. She if actually she sees him through the he must have been swimming. She He's on a boat having a party. Oh, so she just like in the Disney version. Her, she peeks her head up. The deal is. OK, so 
<laughs> she's one of five dots. She has five older sisters. Uh, she's the daughter of the Sea King. And there's this deal that on their 15th birthday, each one of them is allowed to poke their head above water and see the above water oh, world okay. one for the first time. Got it. At the age of 15. This is their... Um, yeah. Uh, Quinceanera. Yeah, no, no. I was going to say... Quinceanera. I was... <laughs> I was going to say it's like when the Amish go to Rub Springer. Yeah, this is their Rub Springer. Uh, it's actually it's more just like they just kind of get to poke their head and look around. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, and all and and this mermaid who does not have a name, by the way, she has no the, name. In this, she's the little she's mermaid. The, she's the little mermaid the because she's the one. youngest of the sisters. Right. And so each of her and they uh, they're all one year apart in age. So every year for five years, she has to listen to her sisters talk about how great the 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 air world is. From that one time they poked their yeah, heads exactly. above for a minute. And so when it's finally her turn, she looks up and she happens to see a boat. It's a party barge where the prince is having a birthday party. I guess it's uh -huh. his birthday too. Oh, that's uh, sweet. and she falls in love with him. But then that boat sinks and she saves him. Oh, okay. And she brings him to shore, much like in the Disney version, but she leaves him next to a temple. And uh. the temple has some priestesses who come out and the mermaid runs away. So the prince never even sees her. She He's, flops away. Yeah, flops away. Sorry, not runs away. Yeah, she. <laughs> yeah, she does the whole what fish do. Yeah, she yeah, flops. she dry flops, gasping yeah. for air, yeah, yeah. for water. <laughs> and then she, uh, and so instead the prince is found by a group of priestesses who uh -oh. then nurse him back to health. Okay. Later, when she has her legs and can't talk. And she's bleeding profusely yeah, and stumbling around in The prince finds and, her and, <laughs> and he, he is just he thinks that her dancing is amusing and he likes her dancing. And so he keeps her around as his buddy. And because she can't talk. Her, her dancing is, is stumbling and agonizing yeah, pain exactly, yeah. with bloody feet. Well, the deal, okay, part yeah. of the thing, I guess part of the spell was that she will be able to dance really well, <laughs> but it causes her pain to do so. But okay. she knows that he likes her dancing. So she dances for him. Oh, I see. Putting okay. herself in further agony. Oh, I see. So this is sacrifice upon sacrifice yeah. is what we're and doing. And then he okay. basically, because he says, you know what? Mute dancing girl, you are my best friend. And he tells her all oh, his secrets. But it's friend zoned. Pretty yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Because he tells her, My parents have arranged a marriage for me to another princess, but I don't love her. Oh. I love the girl who saved me when I drowned. Oh. Which that's is not her. the mermaid, because he never saw her. And he, she it's can't the, tell him because yeah, she has no tongue. It's the priestess. He's in love with the priestess who nursed him back to health. But little does he know, she actually did save him. Oh. And also, little does he know that that priestess is the princess he's supposed to marry. Because this her is a parents, very contrived plot. Yeah, it's almost Shakespeare. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> her parents sent her to the, the temple to like get training into like how to be a proper woman. Oh, I and see. And so okay. in this weird, tragic turn of events, she actually delivered him to her competitor <sighs> for his, his love. Uh, and he ends up marrying this other princess. And so she's like, okay, well, like, it's the night of the wedding. She's like, tomorrow I'm going to die. Yeah. And uh, her sisters show up and mm -hmm. they're like, hey, we went and sold our hair in a gift of the Magi situation to the <gasps> sea witch. Uh, uh, and she uh, told us that if you stab and kill that fucker <laughs> and then drop his blood into the ocean... You'll turn back into a mermaid and you come back with us and live forever. Uh, well, mermaids don't live forever, but they live for 300 years. Yeah, then they become a sea foam. Yeah, but they don't have a soul, and that's what she wants, is that the soul is eternal and lives on forever in heaven. Basically, she wants to get into heaven. Right. Yeah. Well, so, so actually, that gives her a selfish motivation as opposed to, although I guess that's off the table at this point, because she's either going to die tomorrow yeah. or turn back into a mermaid. So she's not going to heaven no matter what. So she, uh, they give her a knife and like, go, go, Is she gonna kill? go kill that That's guy. That's the question. And instead, uh, she doesn't do it. She doesn't kill Aww. him. And uh, she turns into sea foam and washes away. But then she wakes up to find herself in warm light. And it turns what? out because she was selfless and didn't kill him, Aww. she doesn't get a soul. She gets to become <laughs> she gets the next best She thing. gets to become a spirit of the air, which gives her the chance to gain a soul if she does, spends 300 years doing like good deeds and helping people. Wow. And the story <laughs> okay. ends with this like warning to children that anytime a child is good, yeah, it knocks a year off of her 300 years. She gets that much closer to her soul. But anytime a child is naughty, that's one more tear and one more day of her sentence that she has to work Oh geez! Right. So you're all re you kids are all responsible for how long she's in limbo. Now this so is a fact good. that the author of Mary Poppins once famously wrote like a condemnation of the Little Mermaid story, <laughs> where they're basically like, 
<laughs> Anderson was a fucking asshole because he like is morally blackmailing children yes. into being good. Yes, with the, like this a, is the, pro, the the proto Santa Claus. Yeah. Um, thing. <laughs> now, like I said, that mermaid has no name, but in Disney, she's called Ariel. Oh, right. Which is taken from Shakespeare's The Tempest, oh, in which okay. Ariel is not a mermaid, but a spirit of the wind, oh, like yes. the little mermaid is supposed to turn into. I remember that. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. However, there is a fish person in uh, The Tempest, and that is the character of Caliban, who is a grotesque half man, half fish monster, oh, yeah. who also serves Prospero. Um, that was I, maybe my favorite character. I got to go see The Tempest. Um, uh, year or two ago two years ago at um uh the oregon shakespeare I, that's become one of my favorite shakespeare have you, have you seen it or you read it uh we uh, had to read it in like eighth grade and do like a kind of in-class performance it's really good it's one of his last plays yeah. i think and it's a little lighter than some of the heavy duty ones like mm-hmm. othello and hamlet and it's boy it's got some really good soliloquies and some cool like plotting and, and it yeah. takes place like in the new world it's like in the caribbean yeah, yeah yeah and it's and it's pretty yeah it's it's kind of it's not light-hearted like um midsummer night's dream exactly but yeah. it's it's a little bit more fun i would say that's a good one so that's where uh ariel comes from yeah and now we're gonna turn this whole little mermaid thing uh on its head with the tail up in the air <laughs> <up>. yes <laughs> okay okay so remember like about a year ago or so Disney made a live action remake of the Little Mermaid, and there was a big controversy because all those fucking right wing. Oh, they idiots... they were upset that she was black. I exactly, guess right, right, yeah. Okay, when and they didn't, complete... and didn't have red hair, or does she have red hair? She has like reddish hair, but I she's haven't black, seen and it. that's the thing that bothered them, right? Right. They were so busy getting upset about that, they failed to realize the real controversy, which is actually fucking rad in my book. <laughs> Hans Christian Andersen was bisexual. Oh, the Little Mermaid is about his own experience when he declared his love to another man and was rejected. Oh, that's an interest. So it's a metaphor. It's a queer allegory. Really? You, there's a lot of feminist takes on the Little Mermaid where you hear people criticize, like, "Oh, it's all about the importance of you know a woman should shut up and have a vagina." Right. 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 Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Which is like, no. In the original story, she doesn't find love at all. Yeah. And it's actually. Uh, it's okay. not, yeah, it's so about, let's let's okay. go through the well, plot that, again with that in the mind. The deal was that he had written a love letter to this guy uh-huh. and basically declared, like, I want to be a woman for you. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. I wish I was a woman so that I could love you the way that you need to be loved because the guy rejects him because, like, dude, I'm... Yeah, like that of Montreal song. Yeah. Yeah. Tim, wish you were born a girl, wish you were born a girl, so I could have been your boyfriend, I know. So... The the um the point is that it's an allegory for his own experience about ch- it's about changing who you are to try and get love and he's like uh-huh, he would okay. sell he would sell his own voice he would sell his voice to a sea witch if it meant that he could become a woman wow to, for this guy okay then he would perform in a way that it would cause him physical pain but he would still do it because he loves this person got it did right? he write that in the letter or it's inferred it's inferred but like okay gotcha gotcha like 99% of hans christian anderson um scholars agree with this so like no that oh, is okay exactly, so there's there's, is, there's enough evidence to that, back it up this, is this isn't just some maybe theory this no. is probably true um okay. wow. here, i might have the quote here is the uh, a quote from the love letter that he wrote to the man named Edward Collin. He wrote to him and said, I languish for you as for a pretty Calabrian wench. My sentiments for you are those of a woman. The ah. femininity of my nature and our friendship must remain a mystery. The love that dare not speak its name. Oh, thing, yeah. Right? Not Oscar Wilde. This is, uh, but that's what he was talking about. Oscar Wilde's going to join this conversation. Oh, he will. Okay. Second. Yeah, he's okay. here too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course he is. Of course he's here. <laughs> <clears throat> so that brings us into mermaids at large as a queer allegory in their hmm. role in culture hmm, um hmm, hmm. they're really big in sailor culture and i know there's the stereotype of gay sailors right oh yeah in the navy yeah right well uh, it's not just a myth like it really is in the past hmm. the sea to the sea is where people who didn't fit in with society's norms went 
Oh, that's yeah, you, yeah. You become a sailor. It, Some it, it was like I I need to remove the temptation of women, so I'm going to the sea. That was a classic thing. Like I'm going to be celibate. I'm going to go hang out with all the men, right? To exactly. Avoid the temptation right? of women. Yeah, with, yeah. In the boys' club. And then, in the sea. Uh, then you have the case of like pirates, uh, lots of gay pirates. And, really. Um, so there's interesting. This, this there was this myth at one point that women on a ship was bad luck. So uh-huh. women who wanted to go to sea would disguise themselves in men's clothing. Uh, I have heard of that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and there were, so um, there you go. I'm trying to remember the name of the two pirates, uh, Mary and Mary, and Bonnie and Mary Reed. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And they, they hung out for a while with this dude, Calico Jack, in a thruple, a romantic ah, thruple. Uh-huh. Uh, and then it, and then Calico Jack left the picture, and it was just Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed, and ah. they uh, dressed as men, but everybody knew that like so they kind of they, they all. Well, that's knew. the thing is that yeah, it was very accepting in the culture to the point where woman on a woman on a ship is a bad luck, but if she dresses like a man and declares she's a man, she's a man. Oh, that's super fascinating. So yes. how progressive of them, right? From these pirates of yesteryear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then as there's long as you, you can tie all the knots and and yeah. uh, do the pirate thing. We're cool with it. And then with I you. have I have often used the expression "any port in a storm." You know, <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> now I have always used it, not always, but I really like to use it when the issue of gender neutral bathrooms came up and people talking about, you know, how can oh, anybody? Oh, right, right. And to me, it's like, dude. Any port in a storm. Yeah, you, you gotta, gotta take a shit. You get yeah, any port yeah. in a storm. Well, <laughs> turns out the expression comes from a uh, a book uh, called "The Memoirs of Fanny Hill" from ah. 1749, and in it, uh, the narrator uh, finds uh, two sailors. Uh, as they describe it in flagrante delicto. Oh, flagrante to, delicto! Yeah. Oh boy! And, and the quote is. <laughs> I, feeling pretty sensibly that it was not going by the right door and knocking desperately at the wrong one, I told him of it. Pooh, says he, my dear, any port in a storm. <laughs> and so here we have in 749, a story about two gay sailors it's all pink going in at the dark. it. Hey, you know? Yep. In any port in a storm. <laughs> so I'm just bringing that up to show like there's already is this oh, connotation so with sailors in the sea right. and homosexuality or queerness. Yeah. <laughs> now there's this also this myth that male that, that mermaids come from horny sailors uh seeing manatees or do I, I have heard that is and that a myth that's not a real thing i don't think that's the origin of mermaids but there is an example of uh christopher columbus does say we saw some mermaids and they are not as attractive as described they were just saw manatees they, that, in that case they saw manatees. but then to, to, to argue that like that's the source is no because we already saw like you have depictions of mermaids that are 5,000 years old. Oh, okay. Um, but like, I, I always imagine that a manatee, if the lighting is right and only some of the manatee is above water, might look like part of a woman or something. I once saw uh, beluga whales at the um, Vancouver Aquarium. Oh, okay. They had two beluga whales. And the, the whales liked, they kept, they had a tendency to swim upside down with their back towards the bottom. Uh-huh. And when they did, they moved. It's kind of gross. You can see their hip bones. Like you can see their hips, and it does look. Does like it look like a, a person? Woman's hips, yeah, it kind of does. Whoa. But like if a person was like eighteen feet long, you know, it's a little. Yeah, but ostrich. if you're a horny sailor out in the ocean, yeah. But as we already saw, like, whale. dude, if they're a horny sailor on the out in the ocean, they're probably just fucking their fellow sailors. It doesn't really well, matter. <laughs> well, but but that doesn't mean they're not still looking for true, mermaids. True. <laughs> um, look at that sixteen foot long mermaid with the giant hips. <laughs> we also said that mermaids. I said like you know there is kind of. Um, it makes sense that like people would arrive at this idea of a half person, half fish. Right. And I said that there was the uh, liminal space of the ocean, the shore. Yeah. Yeah. And mermaids it's between are, two realms. And mermaids are kind of a personification of that as well, because in the ancient past, the shoreline was either where you went to get contact with new people that could be bringing you trade. Oh, yeah. But they could also be, and you went there to get food, but mm. those people could also be coming to kill you and in, invade yeah, you. Yeah, invading by sea. So the sea is equal parts dangerous, but also life-giving. Like if mm. you need, rely on the sea for contact or also fishing and food, it's very important, but also could be your doom. Or, you know, you go out fishing and you have the, the rough seas and you can drown and die mm-hmm. a very uh it's a transitional pace it's, place. it's dangerous but it also gives yeah sustenance yeah. yeah so it has this liminal thing and so 
in cultures that are any place you're around water, you're going to have this idea of maybe like a combination of the two worlds, land and sea. Mm-hmm. They also can serve as a warning uh, to children. You know, like there's like there's sea monsters. There's the right. dangerous mermaids that will snatch you and take you down. And so drown don't you. so like don't go siren. wading deep into the yeah like into the, the ocean yeah. And then back to the you didn't see the thing. world according to Garp. I did Robin not, Williams. but I heard it's really depressing. It's good. Anyway, there's a port, a part, a, a recurring theme where he's he's told, and later on tells his kid, "Watch out for the undertow, Ooh. which is the ocean." And as a matter of fact, there's also a group of people who all uh, cut their tongues out of women who cut their tongues out. Weird. In the book. Yeah. yeah. Um. Uh, in solidarity with someone who had her tongue cut out, and this was I don't know if that was ever true. It's just in the story. Mm. But yeah, that's funny. That's a funny coincidence. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Good movie, um, World According to Garp. And then also, like we uh, so the mermaid itself being transitional between land and sea can also be transitional between male and female, mm-hmm. evidenced by the fact that we have mermen and mermaids. Mm-hmm. You see both. But, um, and, and the Little Mermaid story, but also, uh, like I said, Oscar Wilde. He writes this, this story called The Fisherman and His Soul. Oh, okay. And Is this soul as in the... Fish soul or a no, soul? No, soul, soul is in the soul that mermaids oh, okay. do not have. Uh-huh. In the story, uh, a man falls in love with a mermaid and uh, is chastised for it, you know, by people. Like, it's unnatural. It's an That's unnatural act. That's not cool. Yeah, it's an unnatural act. It's a sin. Yeah. It's a sin to be in love with the mermaid. Mm-hmm. In the story, the uh, sailor and the mermaid both end up dying, but they're buried together. And, Very Edgar Allan Poe romance. Yeah. <laughs> and then that grave sprouts f- flowers miraculously in the spring. And uh, the, a priest who early in the story told him that their love was unnatural and a sin. Seeing the flowers is forced to admit that maybe their love was not an abomination and ah, okay. it might be acceptable. And part of the reason that it's an abomination in the story is that uh, they can't reproduce. So there you There's, go. She doesn't have a vagina. It, it's pretty obvious allegory there. Yeah, it's, yeah. So it's sinful relationship because it's obviously based you're on not lust. Gonna, yeah, it's, you're not you going to make babies. Exactly. So, and yeah. that story uh, was then used as evidence of um, Oscar Wilde's own sodomy and his right. na- his queer nature in his trial. They brought up his earlier writings. Like, well, in that story you wrote, The Fisherman and His Soul, that clearly has gay subtext. And therefore wow. you are a sodomite. Right, right. And then the idea of... Uh, Mermaids and being kind of a, a queer symbol carries on. Uh, there's been a long-standing tradition in the drag community of a stock character, which is the drag mermaid. Oh, okay. But particularly, it gets used by drag performers who are in wheelchairs. Oh, that that makes perfect sense because then you can yeah. do that. Yeah, that that makes they're the a lot mermaid, of sense. and it's a very uh, popular. A character that gets played uh-huh. to the point that Lady Gaga, I guess, in her stage show has a whole number where she comes out as a mermaid in a wheelchair and does her whole That's thing. That's awesome. Oh, I love Lady Gaga. So yeah, uh, <laughs> nice. mermaids, super gay. Wow. Wow. That's really fascinating. Um, um, yeah. A lot of that is news to me. I like that. And I think that's about as much as I got to talk about right now. I've that. got a Garth's Corner on the horizon. We're oh, great. a vast. Avasti. <laughs> On to the west. Knots ahead. Several knots ahead. Here comes Garth's Corner. There once was a lass who sailed to sea atop of a yellow submarine. She left the end off to rhyme right because she refused to sail to sea. There she may be below Marie. It's quite important to Tate that the rhyming works even though no one called Tate and Tate. Way, hey, the siren song sounded like... From a stoner's bong, it drove Tatum mad and so we sang. Tatum, who went by Tatum Ford, did strap herself to the mast after. She plugged her shipmates' ears with wax so they missed the siren song. Now Tatum's name was Tatum Ford because she had tried this thrice before. Roger Keel and loose anchor saw her past selves miss the song. Away, oh, hey, hey, the siren song sounded like to Jeep Jim Chung. I'm not exactly sure what it meant by that, but anyhow. So let's explore this Ulysses Pact. If it's a bad deal, we can send it back. For who wouldn't want to hear a siren's purr now in this Garth's Corner? All right, so welcome to Garth's Corner. Um, this is uh, this is uh, about uh, the Ulysses Pact, or the Ulysses Contract. 
you looked into this a little bit when I told you that we were going to do this. Yeah, right? just a little bit because I got confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is something that I heard about many years ago um, in a Radio Lab episode from like 2008. It took me a while to track it down, and um, so I'm going to go into it a little bit. It's an interesting concept. Um, it's all about. It's all about. Uh, putting your future self into a position where you have to do something because you know you can't trust your future self. So it's called the Ulysses Contract because uh -huh. of the story of the sirens, which we mentioned in this episode, but we never actually told the story. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with the story. Okay. So um, Ulysses or Odysseus, same person, they're heading, heading home from the wars, uh, the Trojan Wars. Yeah. And, uh, the Great War. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Great War was over, and they were heading home. And um, so it's Odysseus on a boat with a bunch of his men. They're not all dead yet. This is earlier on in the story. <laughs> I think they maybe saw the Cyclops already, but the, he knows, he knows, as they go along this one part of the coastline, um, that there's these sirens. That... It's because they, they already were with uh, Circe. And she tells him. Oh, okay. So yeah. yeah. So he hears about this, and and the, and him. the whole idea with the with with the sirens is their singing is so beautiful that you cannot stop yourself from going to them. It, it's either seductive or or you know there's a spell on you. You you will not be able to avoid going to these sirens and then you'll get dashed upon the rocks and they'll eat you or whatever. Mm -hmm. the, the, the chicken ladies will eat you. We never find out in the original story what it is that the song says. So it could either be so beautiful or maybe also contains forbidden knowledge. Could be, but it's what, well, but even forbidden knowledge is like, Oh, well now I have the knowledge. That's good. Or but the it promise draws, of, it's, it's the, the pro promise. It's a promise yeah, it's because a promise it draws of, people. Yeah. If you hear the song, you're going to go and yeah. and just know this. Now you may have the best willpower in the world, but you will not be able to stop yourself from going to them. And so you, Ulysses has a plan. So he's like, well, I know what I'll do. I'm going to have you. He has his men tie him to the, to the mast of his ship so he cannot move. Mm -hmm. And then he has all of his men plug their ears with wax yeah. so they can't hear it. So as they pass by, the men who are rowing the boat can't hear the siren song. Odysseus can, but he's bound. So even though, because he, he knows in the future, yeah. he's going to try to get them to turn around. He's going to yell at them. He's going to pull the oars out from their arms. So he binds himself so that his future self is is unable to do anything about this. Because just got to know what they sound like, But that's like, the man. funny thing. He doesn't just put wax in his own ears because he's so curious. Yeah, he's <laughs> so he's like, all right, I'm going to have you bind me. And it's, I mean, it's just like in um, Young Frankenstein where he's like, now, no matter what I may say, yeah. do not open the door of this room. <laughs> What's the matter with you people? I was joking. Don't you know a joke when you hear one? <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, well, even if, no matter what he says, they can't hear him anyway. That's true, but like, that's why. He's, but he's bound to the mask yeah. because otherwise yeah. he'd he'd like pull the wax out of their ears, knowing yeah. that yeah. So anyway, um, the the plan works. He gets to hear the song, and then they move on, and then that's the whole story. There's not really a lot of action, but it's an interesting concept of knowing you won't be able to trust your future self, and that's what the Odysseus. So you try to like contract. hobble your future self. Exactly. So that's what this is all about. And self um, sabotage. It, it, this is a thing that. Um, a lot of people who are a addicts to things will do in order to stop themselves from doing it. Like if you want to quit smoking or something mm -hmm. else, you'll put something – you'll you'll set things up such that awful things will happen to you in addition to – The you awful know, things will happen to the, you. The awful things will happen to you because you're smoking. That's because that's not good enough. So there's some, some psychology to that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's right. Uh, so <laughs> um, in this Radio Lab episode uh, – which I recommend you listen to. Um, it's called um, the. Uh, it's called you versus you. It's from March of two thousand eight. Uh, they interview economist uh, Thomas Schelling, and he he gives another example of this, where um, uh, Xenophan, the Greek, he has an army, and he's uh, being chased by Persians, mm -hmm. but and he knows he's going to have to battle them sooner or later, so he intentionally positions his men, like the whole army on the edge of a cliff so they have no escape yeah and he does this one so that they won't chicken out and run away wall, the, the, yeah but he does this on purpose like our last stand will be in an, in a no-win scenario or a scenario where we have to win or die 
And he's doing this as an intimidation tactic against the Persians because he because the Persians will then know that they don't have a way out. So, yeah, so that that proves that they're going to fight to the death. Yeah. And I guess it worked because he was able to tell about it later. Uh-huh. So yeah, um interesting thing. He's 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 setting it up so he has fewer options in the future and that actually gave him a strategic advantage over the Persians because they're going to be more scared of fighting these guys that are have cornered themselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting. interesting. Um as far as like quitting smoking goes, uh, the Radio Live episode also goes into these two ladies, uh, Zelda and Mary, and they have a pact because they've been smoking their whole lives. And they're very into like progressive causes in the 60s mm-hmm. and civil rights and all of this. And so finally, Zelda, she can't help it. And she's trying to quit a million times. And so she tells Mary, all right, I know what I'm going to do. If I smoke a single cigarette, uh-huh. I will give $5,000 to the Ku Klux Klan. Okay. And and that's enough. <laughs> to, so that and she never smoked again. But like I, I feel like I don't know why that works cuz to me so, it'd be like you could just as easily say like no 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 I changed my mind. I'm not Yeah, no no. Me. Well, you you have to you have to cuz that's why she told it to her friend. She didn't just say it to yeah. herself cuz she already can't trust herself. But, but the thing is but there is not there is no consequence for her breaking that. To say well, like, it, it's it, I mean, obvi- other than obvious, your own word, obviously you have to follow through. But yeah. if you're doing this to try to quit and your friend is in on it to hold you to account, but obvious, you, obviously yeah. you can always get but out. But it of sounds it. like this is a friend who also doesn't agree with the KKK. No, of course not. No. So the, the, why would they force them to do it anyway? I don't know. It, it it's it's a, there's a little bit of a suspension of disbelief and a game to it. Yeah, yeah. But she took she did she meant it seriously to get the stakes high enough. Yeah. And and it worked. So she didn't. She never did it again. And the way this works psychologically is, you know, she knows she shouldn't smoke because it's bad for your health, and there's the threat of cancer and all mm-hmm. kinds of things. But that's not immediate and awful enough. But if you think to yourself, boy, if I have one more cigarette that I'm craving really badly right now, immediately just you imagine the five thousand dollars out of your account, and yeah. now it's in the coffers of the Clicks Clan, and that's an awful thought <laughs> for anybody who's a decent person. Yeah. So so that was enough for her, is because it, it gives that same amount of urgency that. She feels the urgency to have a cigarette, Mm -hmm. but then now there's a conflicting urgency where, hey, if you have the cigarette, there's also going to be money going to the KKK. So (laughs) so that is an immediate bad effect of her doing this thing, and that's enough to tip it because it's it's an emotional, uh, you know, uh, calculation you're making in your head. So it's sort of a way of, like, giving ammunition to your superego over the id. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously it's all self-induced and she can just opt out of all of it and smoke a cigarette anyway and not give them money. Yeah. But, you know, we play these games with ourselves and it can work. So, yeah, the the the, the point of this guard's corner is if you're trying to stop yourself from doing something that you know you're going to do, uh, maybe you could you could make a deal with yourself <laughs> that you'll do something. Something even worse will happen. Uh, it, it, it worked for them. So I, I just find that kind of a thing very interesting as yeah. a, a motivational um, way to go about things. So yeah, that's been Garth's Corner. Uh, the, the there was gonna be more, and I was looking for the article because I read it years ago. But it was about, and maybe listeners will know what I'm talking about and they can tell <laughs> us. But it, it it's killing me because I wanted to bring this up in the Garth's Corner. But it, there was another angle to this about uh, gambling addicts who can't help but gamble and they're yeah. just losing money. But they they want to stop, but they just keep thinking to themselves, well, maybe I'll get it. You know, yeah. there's that. That awful what if in the back it's of your like head. It's like if I stop now, then all the money I put into this was wasted. Yeah, the sunk cost fallacy. And yeah. I mean, that's what casinos rely on you thinking thinking that way, yeah. which is not accurate. Accu- in, in reality, statistics are statistics. Your odds are not going to be any better, even yeah. if you're on a losing streak. But it doesn't feel that way. So for somebody who's, uh, you know, can't stop gambling, there there is a program. And again, I wish I knew what it was called or could give more information about it where you can agree you, I guess you give people your bank account in for whatever but you can agree that even if you win mm-hmm. at gambling you will not get that money and it's like a contract you set up with this company and they'll I guess take it and give it back to the but you're still paying something. money into play yeah exactly but your incentives should be all gone because even if you win you're not going to get the money okay and the, the 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 story that I was looking for that I couldn't find for this guy's corner is about someone who did that, and so they stopped gambling, and eventually they actually 
did it again and they actually won and then they didn't get any of the money very ironically but that's so that's was this the an deal. agreement wait was this an agreement with the casino that's what I can't at remember. Point, at that point, I'm like, dude, it just sounds like the casino just found a way for you to give, just keep giving them your it, money. It, it and could, I think out. it must be somewhat related to the casino. Or, and or I, and we, I, again, I wish I knew because yeah. I couldn't find this article. And this more, is from years ago. That it could make more this. sense where it's like, no, no, you just you just sign a contract where you're not the one that gets the winnings. They automatically go to this like third party. Yeah. You know, like a charity or something. There there was another one. In which case I would keep playing because I'm like, <laughs> hey, these kids are going to get something. Yeah, yeah. It's got to go to a bad charity. Yeah, yeah. No, no, exactly. <laughs> the Klan. Klan. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was another one in that same article I wish I could find about somebody putting some kind of a poison in their body that reacts really negatively to alcohol because they're trying to stop oh, drinking. Oh, they try to Ludovico themselves. And like, – Clockwork Orange. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you have a drop of alcohol, it'll put you in, like, cardiac arrest. And now you're not going to drink because it'll kill you. So, I mean, I, I, I don't – again, I wish I had the details, but I haven't read the article. See, I never really liked drinking, but I did find a few drinks I enjoyed. Yeah. But now I'm to this point where the medication that I can't drink because it probably could kill me. So I'm not tempted to drink either. There you go. Even if even if you did want it, you, you yeah. know the risks are high enough. Like, you're I, not fucking, even gonna... I actually really used to enjoy pomegranates. I can't what are pomegranates? Them. You don't know what a pomegranate is? I mean, no, I know what a pomegranate is. Yeah. But I don't know what pomegranate, what's a drink? What, what is it? No, no, I just mean the fruit. I enjoy oh, the fruit. Oh, you can't have pomegranates? No. Because really? of the medication I'm on. What else can't you have? You can't uh, have alcohol, you can't have pomegranates. Um, uh, blood oranges or grapefruit. Oh, well, this suck anyway. You think, You're but... not missing anything. Grapefruit's awful. I don't know. Squirt soda's grapefruit flavored. Oh, so even anything that's synthetically flavored, don't... Oh, well, if it's synthetic, it probably is fine, but I think they still use... They, they say natural and artificial flavors. <laughs> I'm not taking that chance, <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, Cause, there's cause, a roll of the dice right there. Yeah, because the odds are, like, if I lose that bet, my liver goes toxic, and Yikes. I fucking go to liver failure, you know? So, so there you go. And... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, anyway, rather that, not. This is, yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad. Um, I'm glad that at least there's nothing else that you can't have. That I know of. Yet. That you know. <laughs> that's like you see those ads on TV for medication. Like, do not take this. Like, do not take finestra if you are allergic to the ingredients of finestra. But what are the ingredients of finestra? Those are a trade secret. You're not allowed to know. They are artificial well, and natural flavors. <laughs> like how? What the fuck, man? <laughs> Roll the dice, everybody. So, yeah, that's been Garth's Corner. Um, I find this kind of thing quite fascinating. Uh, yeah. Stopping your your future self. Because I, I don't know about you, but I often think of things in terms of my current self, my past self, and my future self. And I will often thank my past self for doing me a good turn so that I don't have to deal with something in my present self. Yeah. Um, or I'll do something ahead of time for my future self's benefit. I knew somebody once who had an interesting thing about um... – he was trying to keep himself from going to get fast food. Oh, okay. Right? And it's like, because it's, one, it's expensive. Like, fast food used to be cheap. And sure. it is not anymore. Yeah. It's ridiculously expensive. And uh, he, he's like, but I started to think about it as, like, he started thinking of the gas consumption in his vehicle to mm. get there and to go to places. That's something people often don't and think And he's like, yeah. he, he didn't think about it in miles per gallon, but he thought about it as dollars over time. Like, how long did it take me to earn this money? Yeah, how much of this money am I squandering? Yeah, and so that was the negative consequence to him. It's That's like, good. Yeah, it's like so. It's not just like you know the combo meal isn't just ten ninety seven plus tax. It's, it's also, also the, the time, the time and, and the, the fuel gas. to get there. You That's know, good. That's smart. Whereas you make more bang for your buck going to the grocery store and getting ingredients and making something at home. Yeah, it's yeah. So that's I, I like all. that too because you're not. M m my suggestion here is that you threaten your future self, but yeah. he's just reframing it in a broader, truer yeah. way to really consider and take into account yeah, all yeah. of the negatives. It's good. Um, yeah, it's really good. I realized I didn't even use the example in the. Oh, Cody's holding up his amazing stories. But we're book already here. we're already at like an hour and forty five minutes. Oh, in. screw screw that. Yeah, I had a chapter on mermaids that it talked about this thing called the sea monk. <laughs> <laughs> the sea monk. Yeah, the sea monk. It's Do we a... want to wrap up the episode w with the sea monk? Uh, or is it not anything interesting? It's just another thing, kind of like a mermaid that people said they saw it was a, a fish that they called the sea monk. It's a man that's part man, part fish. Okay. Uh, it actually. Um, Cody's holding up the tome. What's the book called? This is uh, Strange Stories and Amazing Facts. Is the Reader Digest book that. Uh, this is where we have got the faces in the floor. Yeah, it's it was a uh, young believer Cody's little uh, favorite book. Um, so this uh, they they talk about the sea monk. Uh, is um, an animal 
that looks like the combination of a human monk of some kind because it seems to have a cowl oh okay i was gonna say what's monk like about it okay but then it has like fish bottom so it's kind of like a merman but looks like a monk man a monk man yeah Yeah, or mermonk a sea monk and the idea is that the sea monk uh summons storms it brings Ah, storms okay and uh can cause uh problems for you know sailors but here's the thing is that in, in European waters, in northern European waters in Scandinavia and stuff, they talked about this uh, this sea bunk. But in Asia, uh, they also have something that is called a sea monk. Mm-hmm. And it is almost exactly the same thing. These oh, are completely that's crazy. Independent of each other. So and, just a coincidence. And in theirs, they actually, he's actually the, um, the sea bones. And bones is a name for a uh, Buddhist monk. And so this is like this man in the ocean who looks like a Buddhist monk and he summons storms. That's a crazy coincidence because it's almost a double coincidence because I mean, we call monks, Buddhist monks, monks because but they're they're not really, that's our term that we put on. It. Exactly. It's, it's kind of like calling them one of these other creatures a mermaid just because it reminds us, yeah. well, these look kind of like exactly, that, yeah. but it's a different religion, a different thing, but they still use that same coincidentally. And, this looks like a monk too, I guess. Robes and and, robes, and, right? and uh, it's, so it's, I think this is like Southeast Asia and maybe, China as well is where you find the the, uh, the sea bones bonds and uh, in their tradition every ship has a sailor who is the designated person who is supposed to ward it off and how you ward it off oh. is you have a stick uh-huh. with a bunch of bright red ribbons on the end and they do like an interpretive dance and spin it. basically they ribbon dance they do a ribbon <laughs> nice. dance freestyle ribbon dance on the deck of the ship to ward off the sea bonds I love it the, 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 I love yeah, it the, there's all these sailors working hard and doing their oars <laughs> and just one and, guy who's yeah, just and there's this one guy with the little, little ribbons just dancing kind of you know I don't want to be it. you I know uh, stereotypical but it feeds right back to the whole gay sailor thing sure right? sure sure they have interpretive ribbon dancing on their ships to you, ward off the you merman got to, you got to yeah, but I think that's what we'll, where, where we will end it then. Do, do the people of Fiji have any uh, uh, mermaid tales? You know, that is we never I, did actually, actually find that out. Are there Fiji mermaids? Uh, Cody's doing some quick note, uh, some quick research right now. And it while- might be. I mean, if, if Fiji is part of the Polynesia, there are Polynesian myth, myths oh, about yeah. it. Is yeah, um, I think yeah, and there are they do have stories about women who you would call a mermaid, but they're not like fish women. They are women who are humans that live underwater. There's that's a, there's, close there's, there's a Maori myth in New Zealand I know of of one ah, okay. uh, where almost a Little Mermaid type story mm-hmm. where she falls in love with a, a man on land and she he tries to trick her so he can keep her as a a woman forever because she has to return to the ocean during the day, but she comes to him at night. Oh, okay. And because he breaks this promise, she then has doomed to be underwater forever. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, there's a lot of myths that are like that. Uh, same. That's like the Selkie in Irish myth is the same kind of thing. Same kind of thing. Yeah. They had a similar thing in that, um, Pixar movie, Luca. Those are, uh, I heard that movie also has some gay undertones, gay, gay merman. Um, I never really picked up on that, but uh, honestly, it's, I love Pixar, but I don't remember that movie very well. Okay. Having seen it, it kind of went in <laughs> one ear out the other. So possibly I don't recall. <laughs> anyway, right. let's list off the Monster Squadron patrons. <laughs> oh yes. Our Monster Squadron patron producers. Uh, if you, uh, yeah, want to produce us, wait, no, if you want to patronize us. If you want to produce us. <laughs> Well, first you have to throw your dick into the sea. <laughs> yes. And then... <laughs> and then hope that, you know... And then uh... two clamshells will arise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, real quick, about one of those, uh, the, uh, Bifos and Afros, one of them has antenna, but the antennae, or the ante- they have antennae, but the antennae are crab... Clab- They're crab claws! They're what? crab claws! They have crab claws coming out of their head, like antenna. Yes. <laughs> Oh man, I'm glad that that that's a little that's a little extra descriptive yeah. thing that uh, I can't believe really, I almost forgot that really that's like the rounds best, out the story. That's like the best part about it. Are they constantly clip clip clipping? <laughs> Maybe. And the question is, are they crabs or are they lobsters? <laughs> I'm imagining lobster. I'm imagining mm. Zoidberg like clock 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 clock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so yeah, if you want to patronize stuff like this, yes, uh, yes, go to patreoncom slash haunted and become a uh, Monster Squadron producer. Our current Monster Squadron producers are Travis Alexander, the Bi Barbarian, Rachel Krieger, Tom Dahl, uh, Justin Duckham, Kelly Flynn, Gunnar Franks, 
Carla Harrington, Havelock, New Jared, Brian Lamb, uh, TJ Levin Hagen, Alicia Overton, Jordan Ramey, Blue Roan, and Tatum. Oh, yeah. Welcome, Tatum. You got your Garth's Corner song. And uh, if you want your own Garth's Corner song, become a become a Monster Squadron person. Yeah. Uh, also, when you're Monster Squadron, you get to hang out. We just did a hangout this last weekend. That's right. We, we played Jackbox and chatted for a while. Yeah, and we... We got new Jared to join us all the way from New I Zealand. I met him. I yeah. don't think I'd ever met him because I think you guys must have done some, but I think I missed those. No, so he's I... never been oh, on. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So, I yeah, mean, he's... that was cool to meet yeah. new Jared. Yes, that was really cool. And also speaking of our uh, just our, our community, I wanted to do a quick shout out and well wishes to uh, – Ken, who provided the oh uh, yes, and his wife Karen. Uh, there's yes, some I think health issues I think right it's, now. It's looking good though. Right? Things are looking good, okay, but we I'm just want to send that. our well wishes to yes, both of you. Yes, love, much love, yeah. sending to and, uh, you through the airwaves of the internet. If there's anything that we can do to help you out, let us know for sure. Um, oh, also, uh, and then if you want to send us stuff, anybody, PO Box twenty two, Redwood States, California nine five zero four four. Yes. Uh, haunted items or goofy things, cryptid things. I don't know. Whatever. We have a haunted Barbie dog that the Bible Barbarian do? sent us, and it's it's on the least haunted mantle right now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, keep sending us haunted <laughs> toys. We love it. And I think that's going to do it. I think Enjoy so. Enjoy the rest uh, of your Black ha- Friday. Have a good Black Friday. Stay home. Yeah. It's not worth it. Not worth Although it. Although at this point, you're probably out already. Yeah. No, oh, right. okay. Well, until next time, remember <laughs> the only thing that's haunted is you. I think you're a nice, modern gentleman. Don't lie to me, boy. I'm not lying. I know what you're thinking. Here comes old Greg. He's a scaly manfish. You don't know me. You don't know what I got. I got something to show you. You know what that is? That's old Greg's vagina. I got a mangina. I'm old Greg. The Least Haunted Podcast is recorded before a dead studio audience and is a presentation of Sequoia Productions, LLC.